have the pleasure of calling this public forum to order and welcoming Dr. Paul Teresi. As you know from the meeting announcement, Paul is a retired ophthalmologist, a specialist in retinal surgery. And most relevant to tonight is uh, Paul has been the president of the Skinny Atlas Lake Association for, I believe, Paul, 11 years. Going on 11, yeah. Yep. So we welcome you. We look forward to your the highlights of what's going on in our neighboring district. I've got my owl hat on tonight, Paul. I know you do. It's great. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so uh, uh, without further ado, um, everybody, you can uh, gather up your questions and enter them in the chat box down at the bottom of the Zoom screen if you so want. Um, I've asked Paul to talk for about 45 minutes or 50 minutes, and then, of course, the usual questions and answers. So use the chat box if you like, or just store up your, your questions, and we'll do our best to get to you. So, Paul, without further ado, over, over to you, please. Okay. Thanks, Dan. Um, well, I, I appreciate uh, everyone's attention this evening, especially in view of what's happening in our nation's capital, and uh, it's, it's a very, very distressing day. So... We just clear our heads for an hour here and talk about uh, the stuff that we love. Um, uh, I, I want to thank Dana, who's also very, very much part of what we do here in Skinny Atlas. And uh, he's, he's an amazing guy, as you know. Uh, very fortunate to have him working with us also. Uh, he, Dana asked me to speak this evening a few weeks ago and just said, we'll just talk about the Skinny Atlas Lake Association, what you've been doing, you know, what you're currently, what we're currently doing. And so I, I kind of had a carte blanche and I hope, um, I, I mean, I know this, this is a sophisticated crowd. So I, I hope, I know I'll be, be repetitive and you'll, you've heard a lot of this stuff before, but I guess it's worth repeating at times. Um, so I apologize in advance for that. Um, the, uh, what, we'll, what I plan on covering this evening is very quickly a snapshot again of Skinny Atlas Lake uh, and also the city of Syracuse watershed protection programs that have been in place and then uh, focus on some of the things that the Skinny Atlas Lake Association has done both historically and, and currently, and then get into the two main issues that we've been involved with, which are aquatic invasive species management and prevention, and then get into harmful algal blooms uh, and the SLA's action plans and initiatives. Um, just a quick snapshot of the lake, of course, Skinny Atlas Lake, just like Owasco Lake has been a very important part uh, recreationally, commercially in the region is an economic engine for regional activities. And it's also the municipal unfiltered water supply for the city of Syracuse and some of the surrounding communities formed by glaciers, just like the other Finger Lakes, uh, still classified as oligotrophic, low productivity due to low levels of nutrients, it's been clear and pure. That's why it's been rated double A by the New York State Health Department. And, it, and the depth is up to 300 feet, which is, uh, I understand, is the third deepest in the Finger Lakes. Um, and the interesting feature about Skinny Atlas is the small ratio of the watershed to the lake surface, calculated at about 4.3. In comparison, Cayuga is 12 and Owasco is 17. So this small watershed has really served us well over the years in combination with a, with a deep lake. Um, no, Dave, I'm having a little trouble advancing. Let's see, I guess, I guess I'll just use the arrow. Uh, the city of Syracuse, of course, has been drawing water from the lake for over 120 years, unfiltered, um, and uh, has two intakes at the north end of the lake, a shallow and a deeper intake, about a mile from the north shore. Um, it's had a filtration avoidance waiver in place from the New York State Health Department since 1994. Um, the water is uh, gravity fed to the city's reservoirs, no pumps are involved, no electricity, so it's a nice, nice deal. Um, unfortunately, more and more of the water is being lost en route due to an aging infrastructure. It's up to 40, 50% at times. And there, is, there are contamination concerns uh, as the water travels from its source, the lake, to the reservoirs, and that, but that's a topic for another day. Um, this filtration avoidance waiver is an important feature here in Skinny Atlas because uh, it's, um, it's generated 
uh, many protective programs in the watershed. The city of Syracuse, of course, has always been heavily involved with watershed protection and, and uh, inspecting the watershed, the septic systems, um, has had Cornell Cooperative on board for, for a long time, and they've been extremely helpful with educational programs over the years. But the, uh, in 1994, when, when it did receive its official filtration avoidance waiver from the state, the Skinny Atlas Lake Watershed Agricultural Program was, was put in place. So the city has been supporting this program, which is, which is uh, activated through Onondaga County Soil and Water. Uh, Mark Berger is the current executive director of Soil and Water and then wears a second cap, just like Dana does, um, as the program director for the agricultural program. And this has been an extremely successful program. We've been very fortunate to have it in place since 1994. Uh, essentially involving whole, whole farm plans, best management practices, uh, all on a vol voluntary basis uh, among the farming community. And uh, many, many people have, I, I would say the large majority of the farms in the watershed uh, have, been, uh, have been working with Onondaga County Soil and Water and the Ag Program. So it's been a very positive program. We've had a real head start in dealing with our watershed, which is almost 50% agriculture. Um, and I don't know if uh, the bottom portion of my slides, are, are they being, is that, is that being obstructed by uh, the participants, Dave? I, I'm having uh, trouble reading. I don't think so. It okay. looks okay to me. Okay, good. Um, and the one thing that I can't see that I know is there that, that the, the city has also purchased land up, up towards 900 acres in, in the watershed and, and uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it serves as conservation easements. So it's been a very, very vital program on the part both of the city of Syracuse and uh, soil and water uh, and has really uh, been a sound part of the program here in Skinny Atlas uh, for, for many, many decades. Uh, the Lake Association itself uh, was uh, conceived in 1969, so it's over 50 years old as a not-for-profit organization. It was a uh, fairly fledgling organization for most of the time with just a small core number of folks involved, not much funding. Uh, but the mission has always been the same. It's basically an advocacy group, just like AULA, uh, promoting protection of water quality in the lake and environmentally sound regional management of the watershed. We, we look at ourselves as catalysts, as advocates, certainly have nothing to do with policy or regulation or, or enforcement. Um, we now have an office, which is at St. James Church on Genesee Street. We haven't been able to use it much the last 10 months, but we've had it now for a couple of years and it's in a very convenient location right at the north end of the lake. Uh, and uh, it has served us well and hopefully will continue to do so. Um, Rachel DeWitt, uh, whom many of you know, was our first executive director in 2018, 2019. Uh, she was pretty much fresh out of college a couple of years and serve, served uh, as executive director for a year, then went off to graduate school, just got her master's at Scripps in San Diego in, in uh, marine biology and, and coral reefs, and is just starting to serve a very prestigious fellowship in Washington, D.C. Um, for a year. <clears throat> We were fortunate to have her here for the last few months and she's helped us uh, put to finishing up our watershed and lake manual, which is up for publication and distribution this spring. So we're really looking forward to that. And the other thing that Rachel did while she was here working with Frank Moses, our current executive director, <coughs> excuse me, is she did come up with this SLA story map, which uh, is, which is a phenomenal thing. I know Dave, I was talking to Dave Carr earlier and he said that there's one that the Finger Lakes Institute has, but uh, I, I'm, I have the link up here and, and Frank will get it up on our website uh, soon. And I would welcome you to come to it, look at it, uh, go through it because it really pretty much has all of the programs that we've been involved with up to the minute. And uh, it, should serve, it should serve our community well, just in keeping in touch with what's going on in and around the watershed and the lake. Uh, currently, Frank Moses uh, is our executive director and um, Frank's an ESF grad. Uh, and he's, uh, it'll be two years in May that he's been with us as, as the ED and has done a wonderful job. He just had another newborn uh, two-week-old baby boy, Oliver, and he has a three-year-old at home. So he's, his plate is full right now. So I'm not even sure he's able to tune in with us tonight, but otherwise he'd be, he'd be here with us. 
I've, I've included all of his contact information. Uh, one of the, the first inflection point really in, in our Lake Association was the arrival of this milfoil monster, which we, we like to call him. Uh, and we, uh, we, we got involved, the Lake Association got involved because it was a not-for-profit or a 501c3. And uh, when the Invasive Species Monitoring Committee was set up in the town of Skinny Atlas uh, around 2006, uh, because of growing concern about aquatic invasive species. They were already experiencing the effects from zebra mussels and quagga mussels, uh, more of a nuisance thing than anything else for the city's municipal uh, intakes and also for folks who live around the lake concerned about the villagers or the larvae getting into the um, intakes. Uh, not, uh, not any, no idea really what the implications might be for harmful algal blooms uh, two decades later. But then with the growth of milfoil um, uh, growing exponentially over the course of five to six years, um, forming these dense, thick mats of growth uh, all along the near shore area of the lake. Uh, there were 38 documented patches like this in 2001. And then five years later in 2006, there were over 111 patches identified. So. Uh, because of the concern of the, uh, about this uh, growth of milfoil and having it affect the health and vitality and attractiveness of the lake um, and, uh, and even perhaps water quality in the future, uh, the king of Skinny Atlas Lake, I like to refer to Bob Werner. I'm sure most of you, if not all of you know or know Bob, knew Bob well, we, we unfortunately lost him in September, uh, but uh, he was a limnologist uh, active person in the Skinny Atlas watershed uh, on the lake. He was the mentor to most of us who are currently involved with lake ecology here uh, and tremendous loss, but uh, he left so much uh, in his legacy. Uh, the, uh, the first major thing was establishing this Eurasian water milfoil management program in Skinny Atlas Lake. And uh, he, with John Menapace and the current president of the Lake Association, which was called the Tri-County uh, Skinny Atlas Lake Pure Water Association back then, Larry Rothenberg, got together. They were able to glean some funds from local generous donors, got a nice grant from the, uh, the DEC to get us uh, jump-started uh, with the program. And in, and in, um, oops, uh, in 2007, the summer of 2007, this program was launched on Skinny Atlas Lake. We had uh, several donated pontoon boats that were refur refurbished by John Menapace and his staff. Uh, many divers were hired, certified divers. The boats were equipped. And essentially it was a uh, campaign to hand pull the milfoil uh, by the divers. It, it was then placed in suction tubing, uh, driven up to the deck of the boats, accumulated in onion bags, and then distributed in the local fields as fertilizer. Uh, Bob Werner and others were inspired by what was accomplished up at Upper Saranac Lake in terms of their approach to milfoil. And this is really what helped to motivate them in getting the program started. But uh, the program um, has been very successful uh, over, the, over the following few years. It quickly morphed in from a hand pulling suction program into more of a benthic matting, uh, which is what is done uh, in most places nowadays. This is just a little map showing locations in this, this past season in 2020 where those mats were laid. And, um, and the, the prioritizing of the locations for the um, uh, milfoil treatment is established the, pre the end of the preceding season. And Bob, of course, established that technique of using side scan sonar attached to the boat uh, with visual confirmation of the patches and then using special software, uh, converted it over to GPS readings and a, and a survey map that's created. Uh, and, then the, and then the various locations are prioritized. Um, so uh, we've just completed our 14th season uh, attacking milfoil. We quickly learned that we weren't going to eradicate the milfoil because just like any other invasive species, you can't get rid of it. Uh, we can only hope to control it. And we've been in a uh, in kind of a level maintenance phase the last few years. Uh, and we've been able to essentially prevent the milfoil from taking over the entire perimeter of the near shore area of the lake. Um, 
One book I'd like to recommend, probably most of you are, most of you are familiar with this. It's, it's The Death and Life of the Great Lakes by Dan Egan. I, I think it's a must read for any of us who are interested in lake ecology uh, and, and keeping our lakes in good shape. But uh, he points out in this uh, almost Pulitzer Prize winning book, uh, how these invasives have gotten into the Great Lakes. Uh, there've been over 180 invasive species identified in the St. Lawrence and Great Lakes uh, basins. And the fact that the, the entire Finger Lakes region is within the watershed of the Great Lakes and in close proximity to the Great Lakes and very often mirrors what takes place in the Great Lakes, I think, I think it's really apropos for us to become familiar with, with how, how these aquatic invasive species can just suck the life and the vitality out of a lake, uh, not to mention uh, implications for water quality going forward. So I highly recommend that book. Uh, there, are many, there are several existing invasives in Skinny Atlas Lakes, are there, as there are elsewhere. All the zebras and the quagga mussels have been around for a while, the milfoil, of course, the curly leaf pondweed, even viral hemorrhagic septicemia. Um, but the, and this is just, a, uh, just some uh, pictures of those. The, uh, but the, this past season in 2020, two new invasives were identified in Skinny Atlas Lake, one being starry stonewort, which is kind of a, I understand it's kind of a macro algae uh, plant that can grow similar to milfoil. And, and cause the same issues. It, it, its peculiarity is this white star-shaped uh, blossom that, that, that arises uh, along the stem. And then the other uh, invasive that was discovered was the round goby, which is probably even more distressing because of its potential impact on the fisheries. We know up in the St. Lawrence, it's, it's had impact on the bass fishery. It loves feeding on bass eggs, especially during, uh, during the spawning season. So this is something that's going to deserve some watching. Probably came in through a live well or two in, in a fishing boat. Uh, just, just add it to the list. Uh, but with our work with milfoil, we quickly learned that these invasives, once they get in, and as I mentioned from Dan Egan's book, we got another 180 out there in the Great Lakes that are knocking on our doors. Uh, once they get in, they can just uh, really affect the health and vitality of the lake. So we went ahead and said, you know, enough is enough. We want to try and keep as many of these out as we can. So in 2012, we decided to be proactive and establish the, uh, the prevention program, the stewardship program in Skinny Atlas. And uh, Buzz Roberts uh, ha has been the director of that program and has done a stellar job. It, it's one of the first, if not the first, stewardship programs in the entire Finger Lakes region, and I think has served as a model for the Finger Lakes Institute in, in setting up their program uh, throughout the Finger Lakes. So very proud of what Buzz has done with that program. This is a picture of the DEC launch uh, on the lake, and, and you can see from the map here, there are three, basically three public areas, public access areas, the DEC launch up in the northwest sector, then the town of Skinny Atlas in Mandana, in Mid Lakes, and then down in the southern end in the town of Scott Park, there's a public boat launch. Just a photograph of some of the stewards uh, over the years. Um, this is the uh, DEC facility in the summer of 2019. We had a nice visit from Mayor Walsh who came out and learned, about, learned all about the stewardship program on the lake and, uh, and uh, was out here for several hours and did some of the inspections himself and learned how to keep boat, how to, how to inspect boats to be sure they were clean, drained, and dry before launching. And even uh, spinning out of that visit was a nice uh, donation from the city of Syracuse to the program that season. Um, this is down in the town of Scott in the park uh, where we have uh, the, uh, the third public launch area. This is the new, new shed down there for the stewards, which uh, was, uh, uh, possible through a nice donation from the Columbian Foundation, as a matter of fact. Uh, it really helps the stewards store equipment and is, and is a vital part of the, uh, of the stewardship program there. And then finally in Mandana, the town of Skinny Atlas has its, uh, both its wash station and inspection station. The boat washing equipment really has been underutilized, but we're hopeful that this will, this will get more use in the near future. Uh, it, it was through a very generous donation from Onondaga County several years back. It's owned and operated by the town of Skinny, At Skinny Atlas now and in combination with the, uh, the stewardship inspection program there. A uh, couple of things I just want to point out from this past season. If we look here, 
uh, we can see that this, this bar represents 2018, red is 2019, yellow is 2020. Back in just three years ago, we had a little over 3,000 watercraft inspected through the stewardship program. That has tripled in number uh, through 2020. And we all know that boat sales have gone through the roof and, uh, and probably we're gonna see many more boats in the near future as a result of that. But even more uh, interesting and possibly disturbing is the fact that if you look at the bottom of this table, in 2018, there was only just a little over 1% of the boats coming in uh, required removal of any material hanging off the boat or the trailer, usually in the form of weeds or milfoil. And jump fast forward to 2020, we have we've have almost 7% of the boats and triple the number of boats coming in that have been uh, contaminated and required removal from one of our stewards. So that's gonna deserve some close watching moving forward. And I just point that out because I think going forward, aquatic invasive species is gonna, or the control of aquatic invasives is gonna become even more and more important. Um, uh, certainly this is, the, this is the one we wanna keep out of our lakes and we know it's over in Cayuga and has been growing over in Cayuga. Uh, and the problem with hydrilla is uh, I'm told that it, grow, it can grow 10 times uh, more rapidly than milfoil. And uh, it, it has these tubers that grow under the benthos of the lake. Uh, and even though you pull or mat these plants, uh, they can re-sprout rather quickly from these persistent tubers that, that stay alive under, under the lake bottom. So this could really be a problem if it gets into our lakes and we wanna keep it out. And with that in mind, we've even posted a steward uh, during the off season to keep an eye on the DEC launch. Now you might ask, well, how do, how do we fund this? Uh, because it really costs upwards of a quarter of a million dollars a year to keep the milfoil program and the uh, stewardship program uh, up to speed and in operation. And we decided way back in 2011 or so, right after the inauguration of the milfoil program that rather than try to go back to the same people every year and ask for generous donations or try to get grants to support the program, it just wasn't gonna be sustainable and we needed to share the pain. So we set up this uh, pay, dues paying membership program and Fran Fish, who we're very fortunate to have. I call her our SLA membership chair extraordinaire. Uh, she has been unbelievable and has really done a Herculean job in, in keeping the annual memberships renewed using emails, letters, phone calls. Um, and we're, uh, we're above the 1500 mark in terms of membership, annually paid memberships. So, and with some added donations from some of the folks this has helped to, to keep us afloat in terms of paying for this uh, invasive species uh, program, both the stewardship and the milfoil on the lake. Um, so thank, we feel very fortunate to have Fran on our board and so active along with many of the other volunteers. The second huge inflection or tipping point uh, as far as Skinny Atlas Lake is concerned, of course, are the, are the happenings from 2017. And, uh, you know, we, we were, I think, we were pretty smug here in Skinny Atlas, thinking that we were somewhat immune from HABs because of the small watershed, the deep lake, uh, the AAA, uh, the AA rating. Uh, and uh, I think I remember making a comment at our annual meeting in July of 2017 that we were one of the only Finger Lakes that hadn't been affected yet. So I'm gonna keep my mouth shut from now on because certainly two months later, all of this, uh, all of this storm activity in July really led to the perfect storm uh, with a basically a debris strewn lake for the entire month of July with very high water uh, leading into September with an unprecedented 12 straight days of hot weather, no wind and hungry cyanobacteria. Uh, so, the, so we entered the fray back in 2017 and, uh, and we're still fighting the battle. Uh, we were fortunate to have a great board of directors, um, scientists such as Charlie Driscoll from SU and Neil Murphy from ESF, Bill Dean, of course, Bob Werner and others are on the board. We quickly got together and uh, many of you were at the meeting that Mike Falcone hosted at the Hilton Garden Inn in Auburn uh, in October of 2017 when all, pretty much all of our lakes were afflicted with, uh, with these tremendous halves back then. 
And the SLA came up with its own action plan, um, which is st still pretty much in place today, but basically the need to really investigate nutrient management uh, in the lake, uh, may come up with a more robust community education program, uh, establish more of a watershed-wide governance program, um, which the DEC was really uh, advocating uh, for and really suggested that was really one of the things that was really missing in our, in our whole approach. Uh, and then certainly the fundraising to serve as seed money support to carry out some of these programs and others. Uh, so, so right away, this nutrient management team was formed, co-chaired by Bob Werner, Bill Dean. Uh, they got 10 to 12 folks, uh, uh, stakeholders from the city of Syracuse, soil and water, ag program, DEC, land trusts, environmentalists, research scientists from ESF, SU, were, were among the, the group uh, sitting on that uh, management team and quickly got the 9E plan uh, up and running, the application for that, I should say, using CNY Regional Planning and Development Board as the administrator of the plan, um, asking the town of Skinny Atlas and having them agree to become the sponsor of the 9E grant uh, in our watershed. And then, come, and then the SLA was able to come up with some of the money that we raised to provide an early grant to Upstate Freshwater Institute, a little over $60,000, to study the four major tributaries uh, to the lake, uh, one of which was shot well already under monitoring and investigation for a couple of years by the town of Skinny Atlas and the city of Syracuse. But we were able to use to, to supplement even shot well, uh, adding some different, uh, some additional parameters uh, focused on HABs. So in addition to shot well, we were looking at grout, uh, grout brook at the southern end, uh, Bear Swamp Creek and Niles in, in Cayuga County, and then Harold Brook on the west side of the lake in Onondaga County. And then this money that we were able to uh, grant to UFI, we were able to then uh, morph it into an in-kind match uh, to initiate the, uh, the, the 9E plan grant from the Department of State. So that worked out very well. This nutrient management team has worked diligently over the past couple of years, meeting at least monthly, working daily, uh, adding, adding more and more stakeholders to the team, uh, really involving every, every possible stakeholder you can imagine. Uh, and then early, about a year ago, early in 2020, we decided to fold in aquatic invasives and terrestrial invasives management and prevention into the nutrient management repertoire. And it's, this became what we now call the Lake Ecology Team or the LET. So this Lake Ecology Team has really been the, uh, the workhorse for the Skinny Ellis Lake Association this, this past year, as has the nutrient management team uh, the, the previous couple of years. And then the second uh, of the four initiatives that we came up with was certainly community education. And I've outlined a few things here. Um, our lake manuals coming out this spring, we're very excited about that. We're, we're refurbishing one of those donated boats into a research and education vessel and we're, we're naming it after Bob Werner. Uh, it's gonna be equipped, uh, money has been donated in his memory and it's gonna be a state-of-the-art research vessel and education boats. So we're very, very, it's a 24 foot pontoon boat. So it's not a huge boat, but a, a large enough to accommodate small groups. Very, very happy with that. Earlier in the season, Frank uh, Moses helped launch this lake friendly land care. We kind of modeled that after what was going on over in Canandaigua Lake. Uh, and that was very successful. We had several hundred people sign on, take a quick pledge that they would do their best as, uh, as property owners in the watershed to uh, use best management practices on their own properties. And they got these lawn signs to, uh, to display on their lawns or, or on their waterfront to encourage friends and neighbors to do the same. And Frank's gonna launch that again this spring. We're hopeful that other, the other lakes in the region too will, will do the same thing because I think, I think uh, if it catches on, it could really be very helpful. Um, and then as far as watershed governance, uh, SLA is still working closely with the, with the mayor's office in the city of Syracuse and Onondaga County Environmental Office, the county executive um, and attorneys and uh, working hard to try to get something going just like uh, and we tried, we tried to emulate what was, uh, what was happening over on Owasco Lake with the, uh, uh, with the watershed, the municipal council, but that was initially rejected by the city. And now we're, we're aiming more towards an intramunicipal organization uh, uh, that hopefully will 
uh, will be uh, the work will be completed in 2021, and uh, with the with the lead of the city of Syracuse, we'll have an established watershed wide municipal partnership to help uh, with the um, completion of the 90 plan and the utilization of the 90 plan once it is completed. The DEC, uh, Matt, if you're listening, we really appreciate all the guidance from the uh, DEC and encouragement to to really promote the establishment of this watershed uh, partnership. Uh, and the funding, of course, we were fortunate to raise some money in, the, in this, and we call it the Legacy Fund, and that's helped, uh, it's helped tremendously, as we'll see in a moment. Uh, the the uh, Lake Ecology team set three goals regarding HABs, and, and I don't have to repeat these. I think everybody's pretty familiar with them, but first of all, we had to provide a detection system for the occurrence and distribution of HABs in the lake. And uh, secondly, a, a quantitative understanding of the sources of, of nutrients and sediment coming into the lake. And thirdly, to maybe be able to implement watershed and lake remediation project, projects based on, based on that research uh, to diminish the occurrence of HABs moving forward. Um, so like Owasco and many other lakes, we, we, we um, recruited citizen scientists and stationed them around the lake. And on a weekly basis, they inspect the lakefront, take pictures if they're suspicious of blooms, send them to the DEC, which reports them. And then uh, the Lake Association here locally will disseminate that information to the local uh, community. Um, and uh, just this is an example of some of the data we've accumulated this past season from August 10th through October 9th. It was a relatively quiet season like it probably was elsewhere because of uh, Mother Na because Mother Nature was kind to us. Uh, it, uh, a drought, uh, uh, even though we were in a partial drought situation, but um, most of the blooms we had, which were I think numbered about 23, uh, occurred towards the north end of the lake, predominantly around the country, Skinny Atlas Country Club area and at the north wall of the village. And these were ephemeral, short-lived blooms uh, and we're not as persistent as they have been in pre the previous couple of seasons. There were several other blooms that occurred, occurred along the east shore of the lake. Uh, we think that maybe part of the problem at the country club is the, is the anchorage, the dockage that they have there. Uh, the water is pretty still and stagnant. So we have some plans to, to talk to them about perhaps using some mitigation uh, techniques because it's so close to their swimming area. Um, but I think all in all, we had a we had a we had a good season in 2020 because of the a drought and, and literally no runoff into the lake and and the persist, persistent low level low lake levels throughout the season. One good thing that in, in thinking about what happened this past season, uh, with and, and in fact the water clarity, most of us who have lived on the lake for years and years have observed that over the, uh, this past season the water was clearer than it had been. For several several years, and I talked to Rich Abbott, who's the uh, uh, who's uh, been a tremendous asset for the city of Syracuse, and <clears throat> is housed at the um, gatehouse in the village of Skinny Atlas, and he agrees that the water has been uh, looking a lot clearer towards the end of the season. We think because of the lack of runoff, so maybe this portends good news for the future if we can limit runoff and sediment runoff into the lake, that maybe we can gain uh, gain some ground on controlling. Uh, or at least diminishing HABs in the future. I even talked to Greg Boyer about that at ESF and he thought that was a reasonable assumption. Um, so the second, the second goal that the Lake Ecology team came up with was of course research and monitoring potential nutrient input, inputs into the lake. And this list here pretty much summarizes where we're at. Um, this work is being funded again by the Legacy Fund and involves uh, both Syracuse University and uh, ESF. Uh, Charlie Driscoll, who's on our board, <clears throat> his lab at Syracuse University is doing much of the work and uh, some of the projects are also utilizing uh, professors and scientists from USF. Uh, one of the interesting things that Charlie has done over the past couple of years has been analyzing atmospheric deposition at a unit that he's got set up on the west side of the lake near Mandana. And he's actually been calculating the influence of the uh, of precipitation and the amount of phosphorus 
and nutrients that, that come into the lake uh, via this uh, via, via uh, atmospheric deposition. I was just talking to him yesterday, and uh, he indicated that the, the it's quite high. It's in the range of 25 to 30 or 40 percent of the phosphorus in, in, in the in the on the surface of the lake comes from atmospheric deposition. And when I asked him about that, he said, well, yeah, because our watershed is so small relative to the surface area of the lake itself. So uh, he thought it made sense that it, it was that high a percent of the total phosphorus entering the lake when compared to other sources. Uh, there's been uh, extensive stream sampling, which we'll, we'll hit on in a few seconds, uh, and, and also some techniques in studying the sediment in the lake. Uh, and then this new technique of using drones and satellite to analyze plumes and, uh, and uh, at the mouths of streams, which, which we'll also touch on in a second. Um, as far as the tributary measurements, in addition to the four major streams that have been uh, analyzed by Upstate Freshwater Institute over the past few years, uh, the, the, the uh, Charlie Driscoll's lab has commissioned citizen scientists around the lake at 10, at 10 chosen intermediate tributaries that hopefully reflect what's going on in the, uh, within the other 153 tribs that feed into the lake. And um, these are analyzed weekly and then during storm events. And these samples are taken to Charlie's lab at SU and analyzed. Um, and he's starting, his lab is starting to come up with data like this, which is uh, of these 10 intermediary streams is starting to show that some areas are contributing more than other areas, both phosphorus and, and nitrogen. And he, they're still in the process of compiling this data. And, uh, and hopefully within the, within the next year or two, we'll have a pretty good uh, portrait of what's taking place in terms of nutrient input um, uh, externally. The final external thing that's being looked at is this uh, drone project that I alluded to. And this, this is again, a funded project from the Legacy Fund uh, using this uh, uh, company called Bloom Optics, which is a subsidiary of R Rambol, which was former O'Brien and Gear. And they've already done some trial runs this past fall with their drones. Uh, and the, the plan is to wait for uh, the first major storm uh, so they can get out there with the drones, take photos of four selected areas, uh, mouths of streams, document the plumes that are created. And actually the drones are capable of going down and taking water samples uh, from the mouths of these tributaries. And then uh, along with the samples that are taken from the tribs themselves, compared and analyzed. Uh, this is being done in conjunction with uh, professors at ESF. Uh, this hopefully we'll be getting started this, this winter or spring as, as weather uh, dictates. Um, and then internally in the lake, <clears throat> um, Charlie's team at SU has teamed up with Chris Schultz's team in the Department of Geology. And over the past couple of years has studied 17 different transects within the lake and have taken a total of over 130 samples from the sediment in these transects. And that's still in the process of being analyzed for phosphorus. And, and I can't go into all the scientific details, large grain, small grain, but uh, if, if, if Charlie's on, on the call, maybe later he can help with that. But, but that's being taken. And then, and then at the same time, they're creating these uh, flux chambers uh, which this project was cut short a little bit this past summer because of COVID, but um, some of it had gotten underway. But with these flux chambers, then uh, the, the, the plan there is to basically calculate the rate of phosphorus release from the sediments that have been transected and studied previously. And then in addition to that internally, uh, Bob Werner was the instigator uh, with this part of the study, he wanted the macrophytes or the weed study to see with weed or milfoil die off if there was significant uh, phosphorus contribution internally in the lake. So this data is still being um, uh, accumulated and uh, and looked at in all different in all different directions. Um, and then uh, the third goal, of course, of the lake ecology team. Uh, was to see if we could do something, uh, even, even prior to the completion of the nine element plan. And uh, fortunately we have Dana, Dana, uh, Dana Hall, uh, 
who's on our board of directors, agreed to chair this committee of the Watershed Improvement Project Development Team to, uh, pri to prioritize selected areas in the watershed, uh, see if we could get uh, grant funding to do some of the projects. Um, we've, uh, this, this is basically a, um, a subcommittee of the Lake Ecology team. And uh, we've contracted again with legacy funding support with Tim Johnson at Anchor QEA uh, to help us uh, with, this, with these projects, help to select sites in the watershed, help to prioritize them uh, for remediation. And we're, 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 just, we're just starting to gain some ground with this. It's been a lot of, a lot of hard work as Dana will attest, um, but I think we're gaining some ground. In fact, just uh, this week, this project uh, at Dowling Creek, which we started to examine two years ago, a little over two years ago, when Rachel was executive director, uh, is finally coming to fruition. We've got shovels in the ground as of today, and hopefully over the next 10 days, this project will be completed at uh, Dowling Creek, which is, uh, which is, if you look at the map in the upper right-hand corner, which is this little logo here in the upper northwest corner of the lake, it's actually on Skinny Atlas Country Club property. And lower Dowling Creek runs right along the um, 16th fairway, along the border of the 16th fairway, and has been a bit of a problem over the years. Uh, and you can see from the photograph in the lower left-hand corner here, the flooding uh, that, that takes place on a fairly regular basis during storm events. Uh, we, uh, that we were fortunate to have folks from the Nature Conservancy uh, help us with um, uh, analyzing and, and planning this project uh, along with U.S. Fish and Wildlife. And finally, uh, uh, Receive permission from the DEC and the, and, the, and the town of Skinny Atlas to go ahead with the project. Weather has been a problem over the last year, and 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 finally, I think we're we're underway. And uh, the, I'll have some after photographs uh, within a few weeks. Uh, we're we're going we're to start the planting along the um, the banks of this um, of this stream. But basically, the project consists of um, uh, of of um, shoring up the the stream itself and making it more sinuous uh, rather than one directional as it, as it courses down into the lake uh, and then and do the appropriate and then creating more of a, uh, a, a, a or actually a, a creating more of a wetlands on either side of the stream in, within the floodplain of the stream so um, that's the project that's underway currently. Uh, we're under contract at Willowbrook, which is on the east side of the lake here, about two miles down from the north end of the lake. And this is a fairly large subwatershed. And um, we've been working very closely with Matt Marco from the DEC and others, and along with the Army Corps of Engineers. In fact, we hiked this whole subwatershed together uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, and um, uh, we're under contract in the upper reaches of the uh, of Willow Brook on, on on the Brillo Construction Company property uh, to do some work um, imminently on a on a retention pond up there and also a large adjacent wetland. Uh, they're going to be providing the construction in kind services and the Legacy Fund is helping to support some of the uh, planning and regulatory uh, costs leading into the project. But that's, we've already signed the contract with them and they're ready, willing and able to start that project simultaneously. And Dana, I might mention Dana Hall has been instrumental this past year in helping to push this along. He's been an unbelievable catalyst. Um, the, and then in the lower reaches of Willow, whoops, didn't mean to do that. Did I? Did I Oh, okay, we're back. Sorry about that. Can everybody see that now? Back on course, okay. So uh, back back to Willow Creek in the lower reaches of, of Willow Brook, uh, we're hoping to um, contract with the, the, a property owner there just before the stream enters the lake. You can see, you can see this was some flooding that took place in 2017 and it, ha and it has been recurrent during major storms. This is the, this is Willow Creek as it, as it appeared this past summer in semi drought uh, conditions. Uh, but we're hoping to expand and improve upon 
the wetland that exists here down near the, the mouth of Willow Brook to help complement what's going to be done in the upper reaches of the uh, watershed area. Um, and finally, uh, hemlock woolly adelgid, uh, which is not an aquatic invasive, it's a, it's a terrestrial invasive, uh, has been identified um, prominently in the, uh, especially in the southern part of the watershed in Skinny Atlas and also in Atisco. And um, again, through Dana's uh, promotion and leadership, we were able to get together with um, Onondaga, Onondaga County Soil and Water and um, apply for a grant from a Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. And we were awarded a $50,000 grant uh, to do uh, work both in Skinny Atlas and Otisco Lakes uh, in cooperation with Onondaga County Soil and Water. So we're looking forward to that this coming spring. And I know Dana has been up hard at work the past few days identifying uh, or looking to identify HWA in the, uh, in the Owasco Lake uh, watershed. Uh, so this is something we have to keep an eye on because Bob Werner, I remember Bob Werner saying for years that if we lose the hemlocks, we lose the lake. They provide uh, tremendous cover for tribs, uh, a cooling effect on streams, erosion control, and we just can't afford to lose those, uh, that, that uh, vital resource. Um, I, I, I didn't really mean to get into HAB's mitigation technologies. I don't think there's enough time, but uh, we're all familiar with Governor Cuomo's challenge to uh, research, two research institutions, SUNY ESF and Clarkson University, <clears throat> to come up with sophisticated means of handling HABs as they come up in the near future. Uh, and uh, this uh, ESF has uh, been focused on hydro, hydrodynamic cavitation oxidation coupled with advanced chemical oxidation. And Clarkson being more of a, an engineering school has come up with electrochemical oxidation. And uh, they've both developed prototypes which um, have, all, have already been looked, uh, some piloting, piloting work has been done on Lake Neotawanta in Fulton this past fall. It's been somewhat hampered by COVID, but Neil Murphy tells me that he's very hopeful that this spring and summer, they'll be back to work and complete the pilot studies and, and, and uh, let us know how, how effective either or both of these mitigation technologies uh, can be in controlling HABs as they occur. I took this photograph in Florida a couple of years ago, I, I was stuck in traffic behind this trailer and I couldn't help take this picture. And, and, and I just wish it was this simple, but it's not. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention. And hopefully we've got enough time for some discussion and, and, and questions and answers. Thank you very much, Paul. Outstanding presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. I'm looking at the uh, chat comments here first. A couple from Bill Hecht. Uh oh. <laughs> um, so let's see. Bill, you want to um, say a little bit about your couple of comments here? Uh, I've watched uh, Cayuga Lake and I've watched Skinny Atlas Lake for 50 years, and I've seen a continuous removal of wetlands, uh, hedgerows, and buffers, uh, lowlands that I thought would never be farmed, stuff is being ripped out left and right. Uh, there's much more drain tiles being put in. And these drain tiles do a great job of drying the ground out and allowing it to warm up. But they are hydraulically overloading these streams and uh, causing erosion. And uh, just the surface runoff that we get is tremendous and that's carrying nutrients and uh, pesticides into the lake at an alarming level. And I've been very encouraged with uh, uh, Charlie Driscoll's work on the, this whole concept of how much uh, airborne nutrients are being introduced to, into our lakes, uh, which, which is potentially drift from uh, manure storage and manure application. And I'll leave it at that. Yeah, ex excellent comment, uh, Bill. Bill's, Bill's on our board of directors of the Scanning Atlas Lake Association, as you know. Um, yeah, it, it, very interesting information from those atmospheric uh, tests. In fact, I asked Charlie, well, wh what are we gonna do about it? I mean, if, if this phosphorus is being uh, <clears throat> 
is being uh, deposited on the surface of the lake through the atmosphere. And, and he did allude to the fact that maybe we can do some things in the, on the adjacent fields uh, to limit that drift of phosphorus up into the atmosphere so it doesn't precipitate down into the lake. So uh, that's about the extent of my knowledge right now. So hopefully Charlie will have more information for us going forward. Hey, uh, Paul, uh, uh, one of our board members, Julie Lockhart, is, uh, has a couple of questions. Julie, would you like to pose them or I'll read them on your behalf? Go ahead. Hi, Julie. I had to find my little picture in here. <laughs> Where am I? <laughs> um, a kind of perennial question that I've posed and we've all thought about over and over. And I'm um, always curious to see how other lake associations handle notifications about HABs. Um, we have concluded over time that it's basically impossible to do that with any sense of effectiveness. And I have been watching um, your um, website putting out notices. We just other than providing uh, volunteers to walk, you know, weekly like you do, and and uploading to the DEC website, we've pretty much come to the conclusion that we got to put all of our eggs in the education basket and not worry about the notification. And I just wondered if you had any additional thoughts about that with your experience. Well, it, it's it's been a rocky road. I mean, the the intent has been good, and maybe Matt, if Matt's still on the call, Matt could comment on it, but. We've worked very closely with Amy Klinkhammer in trying to set this up and train the citizen scientists. Uh, and, and as you know, um, but there's been some glitches in terms of how quickly this gets posted up on the website. And, um, and I think there's a lot yet to be uh, figured out. Uh, but I think ultimately, if we can get these citizen scientists to take the photographs, get them submitted right away to the DEC, have the DEC say yay or nay and confirm it as a HAB, then, they can, then the DEC can post it and the Lake Association can be used hopefully just to then inform through social media and emailing the, the local community about the presence of HABs in a particular location. So uh, unfortunately, Frank couldn't join us tonight, but he would probably have a little bit more insight into that. Uh, I don't know, Matt, did, are you still on? Do, do you have any comment about that or what we might be able to do to try to make it a smoother process to address? Yeah, thanks. Concerns. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, and obviously communication is is super important to us. Uh, it's fundamental to the education, uh, uh, as much as, or I should say, maybe hand in hand with the education component, that people understand and have transparent, reliable, frequent communication. Um, <clears throat> that said, uh, and we're, you know we're striving to improve that process, as you know. You know, we went from what was, uh, and it has always been, quite frankly, leading the nation as far as this process, but but still in some ways, woefully inadequate to maybe uh, 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 serving uh, its complete purpose to the public in a way that we kind of think and act in real-time data today, real-time information. So, uh, you know, we've gone to the, to the app, if you will, uh, uh, that was the, uh, you know, a year of learning on that process. And I think there are things that will improve with that process for next year. Um, but I also, you know, think that, um, you know, we all have finite resources. And as much as, um, you know, I'd hate to spend, and again, this isn't my decision to make, but but I also think we want to think, we, we, we as, a, as a community want to think about pouring, I'll say, endless resources to perfect the notification uh, versus something that I'll say is just very good versus perfect. And, and we're a long way from perfect. And maybe we're not even very good in some people's eyes, but only, you know, mediocre. But uh, at the end of the day, there, you know, the question is, do we put resources into that or do we put resources into other things such as education, such as these other components um, that are, uh, you know, maybe, uh, you know, because as we all know, sometimes the last 25% costs uh, you know, 75% of the, of the effort. So uh, I'm not saying we're, we're, we're not fully vested in, in improving this. We are, uh, but I think there will come a point where we've, we've run out of, uh, you know, the, the ability to communicate, you know, uh, what in many cases are, are very uh, uh, small. And, and, and uh, Paul, you used the word ephemeral uh, uh, blooms in, in locations that by the time 
you know, anybody can drive out, even Rich Abbott, they're gone. Right, exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Matt. Hey, Julie, we can come back to you if you'd like to pose your second question. Uh, changing the subject completely, um, as we're working on um, increasing our membership, we've We've um, noticed that sometimes we get donations on our website that don't specify they're for memberships. They might match a level, but they don't say membership or maybe somebody sends a check in and doesn't have the membership form. Um, and we've had this uh, kind of philosophical discussion of is this a donation or is this a membership? And can you give a membership to somebody even if they didn't say it was membership? I, I just wondered if you had a philosophy about how to do that. Because obviously the more numbers you have, the more clout you have. Exactly. So it's uh, nice to just do that. And we're not requiring anybody to do anything, uh, you know, other than making the donation, you know. So it's... Um, well, uh, that, that's, that's, that's an excellent question. I, I, Fran, Fran, are you on Are you on the conversation here tonight? I wonder if the Fran Fish is on. Oh, you I'm are. Here. Great. I'm here. Yeah, I've got great backup, Julie. <laughs> Fran, you want to you wanna handle that question? Sure. Well, on our website, we have a format both for making a donation or joining as a member, but our memberships are donations. So everybody gets a letter if they join that they've made a donation. In addition to that, within their membership, um, they can pay their basic membership fee. They can pay something extra and be a sponsor. Um, they, they have a few extra dollars. They can put it into what we call the David Lee Hardy Fund, which helps support the Stewart program. Um, but we also have a donation form for people who want to give to our legacy fund, which is separate. Um, that's specifically for the Alga Blooms. And then last of all, we have a donation form for people who want to give things in memory or in honor of somebody. So I actually just today I finished out sending out 12 letters to people who gave uh, donations in memory of somebody or for Christmas. <laughs> and <laughs> do that. So we, we designate, but to be really honest, if I get something, sometimes I'll get a donation and I'll say, gee, this person's not a member, but they just gave us a hundred dollars. I pick up the phone and call them. I say, did you fill out the wrong form? Did you want to be a member? Or is this just a donation? Oh no, I want to be a member. Okay, fine. So there, there's, I have to tell you, there's a lot of personal interaction in making this work. Um, and, and, and that's good because sometimes people don't realize, you know, the difference and when you educate them as to what the difference is and they get to be better members and they get to be donors as well, which is fine. So I think our website helps to channel where people go and what you do with it. But if there's any question about it, when they're not on my membership list and they send us a donation and they don't say it's for anything in particular, um, but they're just donating money, I usually figure out that they just made a mistake and used the wrong form. So I pick up the phone and call them or email them. So you do try to double check um, as a courtesy. That's good. I beg your pardon? So you do try to double check as a courtesy that that's okay with them before you count them as a member. So Absolutely. Yeah, we, yeah. We, have, we have some very talented folks <laughs> who are very good with memberships and we're lucky. So thank yeah. you. Great. Thanks, Fran. Um, Paul, can you, there was a request of you to stop sharing your screen uh, just so everybody can see everybody's faces a little oh, easier. Oh, cool. cool. Um, I, just, I just stopped here. Okay. And also... Um, hmm. um, that better? Yeah, it looks fantastic. Okay. Or, or maybe not, Paul. Maybe you ought to put your, your screen back up. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> also, not on it. <laughs> uh, Frank Moses is, is on or was on, but he's apparently uh, listening in while he gets his three-year-old to bed. So, oh, okay. Uh, but he thanks you for the kind words. <laughs> hey, uh, Rick Nelson, I saw a question from you. Or, or I don't see your picture. I see it down in the corner in my screen. Rick, uh, you want to ask your question? Uh, yes, I, Paul, I was curious about the funding for your lake stewards. Is that a completely self-funded or is it co-shared with uh, like what they do here at Owasco the, for, from the Finger Lakes Institute, the prison department? Well, good question, Rick. No, we, we started the program, as I said, in 2012, and Buzz has been directing it. And we, we fund that from the from the resources that we glean from memberships, uh, from strictly from memberships. But when the Finger Lakes Institute applied for the grant several years after we got our program started, uh, rather than they suggested that since ours was already up and running, that they use our resources as the match 
so that the Finger Lakes Institute could get the grant for the other lakes. So we thought that would be mutually beneficial. Uh, and But ever since we've still self-financed. So uh, I know Matt Marco's on and Matt and I have had discussions about this, but I don't think we need to discuss it any further right now. But yeah, it's, it's been a self-funded stewardship program uh, with, with the same funds from the membership and the donations that come through. That's great. We have, we have a specific I mean, sponsorship for a steward so people can join as a member or join a sponsor for a steward for a day. And we get a considerable number of those. And Fran, the other thing you might mention is the the uh, the milfoil sponsoring the milfoil book. Right. right. So we have an individual membership at fifty dollars, a regular family membership at a hundred. You can sponsor a steward and be a member for one hundred and seventy-five. You can co-sponsor the milfoil boat for a day for two hundred and fifty. You can co-sponsor the milfoil boat for a day. You can sponsor the milfoil boat boat for a day for a thousand. So we have those elements, and then we have that other category. Um, some number of years ago, a young man died tragically and his family donated his um, life insurance policy to the steward program and it's called the David Lee Hardy Fund and so we tell people you know you can always if, if you can't do something at that level you can always put a few extra dollars in the David Lee Hardy Fund which supports the steward program and we've gotten a tremendous I mean sometimes people just give you an extra 25 or 30 or 40 dollars or 10 dollars or whatever they have and uh, it puts money into that stewardship program as well but we have a considerable number of people who sponsors steward. And the other thing we do, because everybody likes to see their name in the paper, is when they do one of those sponsorships, we put their name in the paper saying they've done so. So that that kind of helps a little bit too. Hey Paul, it's, it's, Paul, it's after the hour, but we have just a few more questions. Are you okay if we proceed? I'm fine, sure. Um, Keith Batman, um, would you like to pose your question? It has to do with, um, I guess to Matt Marco, it has to do with the TMDL over on Cayuga Lake. Yeah, thank you. My camera's not working, but I look great, just so you know. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and no, it just, in, as, I, as I said in, in the chat, this is not the purpose of this meeting, but since Matt is here, I am wondering what the status of the TMDL for Cuga Lake is. That's been something that, um, the, that it's been ongoing for a long time. And last year, I know the commissioner uh, made a statement at an assembly committee um, meeting that it would be out within a few weeks. And it's been, um, I guess it's been almost a year since that statement. I'm just wondering what the status of that is. Yeah, thanks, Keith. And undoubtedly you look great, way better than me, <laughs> thanks, Matt. Who's, whose camera is also not working. Uh, <laughs> so uh, a great question. Uh, you know, uh, it's embarrassing uh, to, for me to answer and say imminent. But I have been told very simple, even on the inside, I feel like I have similar information. It is always literally imminent. Um, so, you know, COVID certainly had an impact uh, to some extent, uh, but it was my understanding that uh, we were extremely close uh, this fall. And to be honest with you, uh, I, I just haven't circled back since, I since the last time I was updated. But since you asked, I definitely will do that and, and see what the new timetable is, certainly considering we're into a new year here. Great, thanks a lot, man. Yeah, thanks, Keith. Good to hear from you. Hey, hey Bill Heck, uh, back to you, but it looks like you're, you're, you've posted maybe three or more questions. So could I ask you to pick, your, pick one and, and we'll go with that? Well, I guess, I've forgotten. I guess the first one was about uh, not reverse 911 notification. And uh, I had an incident over here on Cuba Lake uh, where the sewer line crossing Augers Creek broke and was puking raw sewage into the uh, creek for who knows how long. And uh, there are people directly downstream from that. And uh, the health department uh, showed no interest in notifying the people downstream. I don't know if that was due to liability or exactly why. Um, as far as using reverse 911 for HABs, uh, until we can get uh, more instantaneous uh, notification and testing, it have to be very quick because there are still a lot of people, particularly on Scanning Atlas Lake, that are still withdrawing uh, 
their drinking water directly from the lake. Um, and my other question what related to whether anybody knows of any new technology, because there wasn't any as of last summer of, uh, for a homeowner to neutralize or remove HABs from their home drinking water. I, I, Bill, I'm guessing that the, the first part of your question is directed towards Matt or, or somebody else. Uh, this is regard, regarding the reverse 911. Yeah, that, I'm just, was I, was just a, I was just quite upset that literally uh, maybe uh, two or 300 yards downstream from the sewage break, uh, our county health department uh, didn't want to notify people. And I find that shocking. Yeah. I agree. <clears throat> yeah, I don't. I don't have any information on that specific incident, um, um, and and it sounds familiar, but I don't want to misspeak. Um, uh, but uh, one thing that crosses my mind is the potential of using New York Alert, um, and maybe I should talk. I'm sure somebody um, smarter than me has already thought of this, but with New York Alert, you can I think select certain notifications at certain levels. Um, and I don't know though that they can be selective for like geography. So maybe if like, for example, our HABs notices, uh, you know, were transported somehow to New York alert, um, like, and, I, and I'm, I'm referencing CSOs. CSOs are often, uh, and wastewater treatment plant um, issues are often posed by, via not, not a New York alert. Um, but, you know, they're very hard to just, you know, get discretionary notices and people get so many of them, they just turn it off. Uh, so, so there's that uh, over communication uh, 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 challenge as well. But um, it, it, <clears throat> I've never heard reverse 911 brought up with respect to HABs notification, but, but I will at least bring the question back specifically if New York Alert or other, no, uh, you know, notification systems that that maybe isn't, you know, you don't want to uh, be uh, clogging 911 uh, issues with HABs, I think, but but maybe there's a there's a happy medium. You know, you know, Matt, uh, I know, I don't know if Frank Moses is still on, but he, uh, Frank has mentioned to me more than once about coming up with some sort of a system like that. So he would love to maybe speak with you more about that. Frank, are you on the call still or no? I guess not. He's, uh, uh, he, he is on the call. He's putting a chat in. Uh, he says, New York Alert would be great. Uh, right to NOAC, you can customize how you receive info. <laughs> Please and yeah, thank I, you. I, can I comment through? Yeah, you are. <laughs> there he is. Sorry, and I'm, I, I'm delaying bedtime, so you might hear my uh, son in the background. So that's more apologies to the home front. But um, so, yeah, what's, what I've looked into, I, I mean, you, with the CSOs on Onondaga Lake, uh, with the Department of Transportation, with accidents, the whole New York alert system. What's nice is you can customize how you receive information. So I would love if the Lake Association to play, just played a role in onboarding uh, people who want to receive the notifications and how to tailor how they receive the information so it's not burdensome. It's just we have the information to function and, and, and the people who want to get the alerts as it happens uh, can get them or you can digest where you get it at the end of the day, end of the week, um, and it, it's phenomenal. I, I, I signed up for DEC alerts related to Onondaga Lake. You get news for that. Uh, you can click and say, I want you know information. You could do it per lake, which would be very onerous throughout the state, but uh, I would sign up, well, obviously, if I wasn't working with SLA, I would still sign up, even if it was uh, a finger, you do the Finger Lakes region, maybe by districts, um, you know, break it down by county, uh, but but certainly the Finger Lakes region. I, I I'm sure there's other folks that would want to know if a Hab's hitting, um, you know, other lakes, uh, you know, at, at that time too, and you just filter through. Thanks, Frank. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for uh, Matt for for looking into that because I I think there was in the past some reasoning of of not wanting to incite panic, and I always thought of that you know proverbial or that. Uh, scene from Jaws with the, uh, you know, you got Chief Brody and, on the ferry with the, with the mayors and uh, that's the difference of whether we want to give people the information to function and, and when they need to be safe. 
Thanks. Well, thanks, Frank. You know, Dana, if I may interrupt, I know I noticed Greg Boyer is on the call and Greg, I hate to put you on the spot, but uh, to an try and answer Bill's second question about home filtration and or sanitation, uh, sanitizing, that's, that was your question, right, Bill, in regards to microcystin and HABs? Yes. Yeah, I don't know, Greg, did, did you want to volunteer any insight on that? Because as far as I know, there really isn't any really good system for residential use that's, that's you know, economical. No, Greg is, Greg is muted. I don't know. I guess, I guess he prefers to stay muted. <laughs> in, in relation to this uh, notification, uh, I think we have to realize that a lot of people uh, don't keep up with a lot of this stuff. And it's not just HABs. If, if there was a, a farm upstream from me applying chemicals and we got a torrential rain that's going to wash it in the lake and there are people swimming in there, um, I don't know what kind of potential problem that is. More and more people are sensitive to so many more things today. Um, I, don't, I realize this can all sound a quite alarmist and overreacting, but uh, the world's changing. So everybody, um, uh, I posed a question and I wanna squeeze that in. I'll go last. So I'm gonna try to influence to have just two more questions. So Peter, you go before I do and, and then I'll pose my question. Hey, thank you, Dana. Paul, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. Oh. Um, my question to you is from a board standpoint, how do you prioritize projects? In other words, our board, like many, has limited resources as far as expertise and manpower and money. How do you prioritize what you're going to work on? Well, and that's obvious. It's an obviously excellent question. Uh, and I, I don't. I think what we what we're trying to prioritize now are these potential remediation projects. But the way it, it's kind of evolved, I guess, because we, when we started, I mean, really, our organization was a fledgling organization up until we got involved with milfoil. So, so that gave us a uh, raison d'etre, you know, and, 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 and we then started, the, uh, we got Fran and Fran jumped on the bandwagon got the membership going and all of our resources were aimed at milfoil control, milfoil management. And then the stewardship program came along. So we carved out a little portion of that to get the stewardship program going. And, and so that kind of evolved over time. With the HAB situation and with the establishment of the Lake Ecology team and especially the Legacy Fund, that's, that's another question entirely. We started off with an oversight committee on the, le so on the Legacy Fund. And that has now shifted over to the Lake Ecology team itself. So if we're looking at a particular um, research project or a particular remediation project, that is evaluated by uh, experts who are on the Lake Ecology team, uh, a, a scientist or somebody like Mark Berger or Rich Abbott uh, or the DEC, uh, and the uh, and and then basically the recommendation from the Lake Ecology team goes to the board of directors of the of the uh, Lake Association, and we approve or disapprove allocating funds to a certain project, but we don't really have. We're, we're still in the infancy of, of, of all of that. And we do have a fairly sophisticated way of prioritizing not so much money to allocate, but how we address um, potential watershed projects. And um, I don't have that right in front of me now, but, we, but with the help of uh, Tim Johnson at Anchor QEA uh, and, and Frank and Neil Murphy and Charlie Driscoll and others, um, we've come up with a table uh, uh, of, of priority indicators to, to address HABs in lieu of not having a full-fledged nine element plan in, uh, in certified. Uh, and that's, that's, that's our main prioritization there in terms of what parts of the watershed we address. And there are various things that are plugged into that. But in terms of allocating funds, we're, it's still a work in progress, really. I don't have a, <laughs> it's really, uh, it's a decision that uh, experts help us make on a lake ecology team and then is approved by the board of directors. Uh, Fran, do you have anything to add to that? Well, I think when we want to do something special, we will decide if we can go out and raise additional funds to do it. We had this thought 
when um, we knew that Dr. Werner was not going to be able to continue to do what he always did. And I think some of us realized that perhaps he wasn't going to be with us next year, that we needed to find a way to fill in what he did with his own boat. Um, and so we just made the decision to go out to the community, to a few people, selected people in the beginning, and say, look, we want to do this. We want to have this boat, and this is what's going to cost, and can you help us with some money? So we, we made the priority that we had to replace what he was doing, and we wanted to do more, and we wanted to have the boat to do what everybody else was helping with in terms of research. And we also had in the back of our minds that we wanted to have a place to be able to do some small um, educational programs for young people and even adults, and that we needed this, the right to be able to do it. Well, how do we do that? Um, you have to find money and so you go out and ask for it, quite frankly. Yeah. I don't know if that answers your question, but, um, uh, you know, it's not like we have a ton of money and then we have to <clears throat> prioritize from that. It's, it's uh, just like Fran said, that's a good example, Fran, of, of the, the new research and education boat that, that we went out and raised money for. Um, but I think with the legacy fund in terms of prioritizing monies for research, we, you know, several of us get together every year, we come up with a, with a kind of a budget uh, and, and, what we're willing to pay for certain things that need to be done according to what's been recognized by the Lake Ecology team. And uh, it's kind of a loose, loose thing. I mean, it's not, uh, I don't, we don't have a strict prioritization or a strict budget in terms of allocating funds. We're not that sophisticated yet. Okay, thank you. Okay, our last question, everybody. Um, and again, Paul, thank you very much. But my question is, you had mentioned I, a worse the effect that farmers in the watershed um, voluntarily comply with the uh, best management practices that are advocated, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing badly, but my question is, what motivates farmers in the watershed to, to act voluntarily um, to, to help the lake? Well, I, ho I hope I'm not speaking out of turn. I wish Mark Berger were on the call or... Uh, but, but my impression in working closely with Mark and, and reading about it quite a bit is when the, when the ag program was established, um, a certain amount of money comes from the city of Syracuse to the agricultural program. In fact, I think it's been mentioned that over the course of the last 25 or 30 years since the inception of the ag program, the city of Syracuse has contributed up towards $17 million into the ag program. Or I'm sorry, no. Uh, I think it's more like five or six million, but don't misquote me. But to supplement that, Mark, as the executive director of Soil and Water and his staff, writes grants. And they, and they get uh, probably the majority of the money that comes through is through the grants that they write. And my impression is that they then use this money that, they, that, they, uh, that, that they're granted to help uh, pay stipends to the farmers uh, to do such and such. Uh, so there is. So when we say volunteer, when we say voluntary, it, I, 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 my impression is that with CAFOs, there are federal regulations in terms of how the farms are run, how the manure is handled, etc. And maybe Bill Heck knows more about this. But with with the average da dairy farm that's not a CAFO, uh, there's no strict regulation, and they have to volunteer to participate in the program. I think that's maybe a better way of of saying it. But there are financial stipends that come into play or inducements I should say that's that's my impression but I hope I'm not mis misunderstanding that okay thank you Paul um, so with that everyone thanks for your participation tonight thanks for a terrific job Paul we very much appreciate your time your presentation and and uh, yours and and the members of your staff answering questions so everyone uh, a round of applause, virtual or real, for Paul. <laughs> thank you, Paul. Well, thank you. Thank you for uh, thank you for inviting me. It's always a pleasure. And uh, with that, everyone, we'll do another. I don't know what the topic will be, but we'll do another in early. It would be February, right? Another uh, forum that I hope is equally attractive. Although Paul, you set the bar very high. <laughs> Thanks, you. So, everybody, uh, we'll sign off now. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>